On this lazy afternoon, let me invite you to join me and stay a little while here in the garden. But be forewarned, this is no ordinary garden. The bright bouquet of colors here, the fresh fragrances, the fickle grasses swaying in the breeze serve more than just an ornamental purpose. For this garden is a special place, a healing place. The vegetation here is said to contain medicines, herbal remedies that can strengthen your immune system, cure your cold, help to treat chronic and even life-threatening conditions. Our ancestors have used these botanical medicines for thousands of years. The plants work their effects on the body naturally, often quite gently. Why they're as natural as this brilliant purple cone flower, or that bright white bulb of garlic. The healing ingredients concealed in these plants and trees are one of nature's sweet mysteries. But the mysteries are not sealed shut. The life-sustaining secrets here are open, and during this program you'll learn about them. For this is the Medicine Garden. Welcome. I'm David Freudberg. A natural approach to health care is blossoming throughout our society. More and more of us seek a type of medicine that is preventive, cheap, non-technological, effective, and safe. At least a third of Americans are using alternative health care, according to physician David Eisenberg of Harvard Medical School. You know, people who have exhausted conventional care and still suffer very understandably ask the question, what else should I do? I think that's what's driving the system. They're not abandoning conventional medicine. The fact is that 96% of the people who we could identify in our national survey who saw an acupuncturist, a chiropractor, an herbalist for a serious medical condition were simultaneously seeing a medical doctor for that condition. So this isn't an either or, this is just really common sense. If you're still sick and suffering, you logically say, what else can I do to be better? The wave of alternative medicine rolling through our culture represents a sea change that has caught the eye of television journalist Bill Moyers. Millions of Americans are, are uh, exploring this, using these techniques. Uh, so yes, I think there is a growing uh, audience uh, for it, a growing community for it. What do you see as driving uh, a fairly significant movement among Americans? First is just the high cost and complexity of modern medicine. It's more and more expensive, more and more invasive, more and more indifferent to, to people. That's, economically, a doctor said to me, I have time to see a patient for six and a half minutes, and after that, he or she are not economically viable, and I've got to get them in and get them out. He said it ruefully. Um, Second, people are realizing that they have to take responsibility to prevent as much illness and suffering as they can. And alternative medicine is essentially preventive medicine. It's trying to take care of oneself. Eat right, uh, drink right, uh, don't smoke, don't do those harmful things that, uh, that cause me later to have to turn to a modern hospital or a busy doctor who's going to charge me a lot to fix what I could have prevented. As people increasingly take the responsibility for self-care, they are discovering a whole new world of natural, non-prescription medicines that can be used as home remedies. At this busy health store outside Boston, curious customers examine shelves filled with hundreds of little boxes and bottles containing botanical extracts and teas. The labels bear intriguing plant names like schizandra or echinacea. Some names suggest their traditional use, for instance, feverfew, or depict their appearance, such as golden seal. Some you may recognize as common herbal teas, like chamomile and peppermint. I found that herbal medicine can help you in many ways that normal medicine can't, and it has much fewer side effects. And uh, it's been around for a long time, and it's been very well studied which a lot of things in this Western medicine haven't been. I like the, that it's enabled me to get off of antibiotics and anti-inflammatories from long-term health problems that I've had. And uh, I've been on herbs and, and other supplements for about a year now. 
I don't get sick as often. I buy the natural herb shampoos that have, I think, rosemary is good for the, sh- or the hair, nettle and soapwort. And for the skin, I've used oils with um, like self-heal and comfrey and plantain, which grows anywhere. And um, burdock and cleavers are some skin herbs that really work. I mean, I remember sharing some salve with a friend of mine, and I, sh- I put it on her cut, and... After a while, she ta- she asked me, what was that? What was that? And I told her, she said, wow, because it hasn't itched ever since. What do I use herbs for? I use them for strengthening. I use them for cleansing, um, for liver cleansing. I use them for um, gum health. I use them for antibiotics. Have you found success with herbs? Very much so. I'm really 110. <laughs> The benefits of herbal medicine are sometimes exaggerated, both by consumers and by some commercial interests in the burgeoning marketplace for botanical remedies. Some popular books and magazines make unproven claims about the therapeutic powers of herbs, and anyone trying plant medicine is well advised to first study it carefully. But misinformation aside, In fact, a large body of scientific evidence now confirms that some plants do have definite healing properties. In Beltsville, Maryland, Dr. James Duke at the U.S. Department of Agriculture has cataloged more than 3,000 medicinal plants. This is the American coneflower. This herb now is about two feet tall. It'll get to be three, four feet tall and will have large daisy-like compounds with a pinkish to purplish petals and a brownish cone in the middle. The dark green leaves now, it's just coming into bud. This will come up to about here and we'll have this very spectacular large overgrown daisy. The roots of this are probably the best immune stimulant in the United States. This purple cone flower is also known as echinacea, whose extract is now commonly available in liquid, tablet, or capsule form. Echinacea is one of many herbal medicines we inherited from Native Americans. Echinacea was the best-selling pharmaceutical product made by the firm of Lloyd Brothers in Cincinnati until the 1930s. Dr. Varro Tyler is former pharmacy school dean at Purdue University in West Lafayette, Indiana, and author of Herbs of Choice. It was used primarily for its anti-infective properties, antimicrobial properties. And then when sulfa came along, it fell into disuse. But it has been resurrected in Germany in the last 15 years or so because it has been shown that it functions by an entirely different mechanism than the sulfa drugs or the antibiotics. Instead of killing the microorganisms, it enables the body's own immune mechanism to fight them more readily and to dispose of them. And in that way, it is particularly good for relatively minor viral infections, such as colds and influenza. I'm not talking about AIDS here. Uh, And it is popularly used for that purpose, and I, I recommend it and use it personally, because there is adequate evidence to show that it is effective in helping ward off the symptoms of colds and influenza. Herbal medicines such as echinacea are viewed by some as a safer alternative to chemical antibiotics. Physician and best-selling author Andrew Weil in Tucson, Arizona. First of all, antibiotics don't have any effect against viruses. They only work against susceptible bacteria. Echinacea has activity against viruses. Uh, Antibiotics do not increase immune function. They're just working to destroy uh, germs whose presence may be blocking an immune response. Uh, But echinacea has been shown actually to enhance immune function. It increases the movement of certain white blood cells. It increases the rate at which white blood cells eat uh, bacteria. Uh, So it has immune enhancing effects as well. Uh, Echinacea has very little toxicity, if any. I mean, we don't really, there aren't really no reports of toxic reactions to echinacea. Some of the antibiotics we use are quite toxic. Another problem is that the antibiotics, because they're working to kill susceptible bacteria are strongly influencing the evolution of bacteria. And I'm sure you've read all of these uh, reports. Uh, Now, 
also out as popular books and movies portraying the coming of epidemics that are going to be resistant to our best antibiotics. Echinacea doesn't work that way. It's working mostly by enhancing body resistance rather than killing off susceptible organisms. So it's not a factor which is getting us over time into worse relationships with these agents of disease. And by the way, another significant factor is echinacea is cheap relative to antibiotics. Echinacea is one of the most widely studied botanical remedies listed in a huge global database on medicinal plants maintained by the UN's World Health Organization. Database director is University of Illinois professor Norman Farnsworth in Chicago. There are several different dosage forms, like one dosage form is they take the fresh plant and they squeeze it and get the juice. Another one is they take the plant and make an extract of with ethanol or water. And another one is they just take the powdered plant and put it in a capsule. And if you take probably the most effective one is the liquid one. You put it in your mouth, you swirl it around, and then swallow it. The liquid form, I wanted to point out, about 10, 15 percent of people will get an irritated mucosa of the mouth. If you stop taking it, it goes away. It's probably an allergic manifestation. The usual recommended dose is uh, uh, 10 to 20 drops every three to four hours for the first couple of days, and uh, then you can take it perhaps three times a day. Dr. Varro Tyler of the Purdue Pharmacy School. The problem with echinacea, the only problem, uh, aside from very minor cases of allergic responses that have been infrequently reported is that one should not take it for a prolonged period of time. Uh, You don't need to take it for a prolonged period of time. If it doesn't help your cold within a week or 10 days, you should quit taking it anyway. Any other cold remedies? One of the ones that uh, has been recommended uh, uh, to increase the secretions of the mucous membranes to thin out the mucus and thereby allow one to uh, cough up that phlegm that interferes with uh, swallowing and breathing uh, is capsicum, red pepper, sometimes called KN, but KN is a, an adjective, not a noun in that case, so you have to say KN pepper if you want to talk about it. And that comes in many forms of chili peppers, Tabasco sauce, uh, hot red peppers, hot green peppers. That's all capsicum? Yes, it is indeed. Many, many varieties. Uh, Find one that you can tolerate. But as you know uh, from the watery eyes and the runny nose that you get when you consume some of those hot peppers, the uh, product really increases the secretions of the mucous membranes. So it will thin out that mucus, that phlegm that is so often deleterious when it comes to causing a cough, and uh, it's as good a remedy as any for that. One of herbal medicine's most fascinating features is the reported ability of some plants to strengthen our immune system. In addition to echinacea, some herbalists point to the widely used Chinese plant astragalus as having this effect. For anyone who practices a preventive medicine lifestyle, bolstering the body's immunity lays a foundation for health. That intrigues London-based historian Barbara Griggs, who chronicled the development of Western herbal medicine in her book Green Pharmacy. I think that one of the reasons herbal medicine is going to have more and more of an appeal in this late 20th century is that many of the so-called new diseases that we're seeing, things like post-viral fatigue, uh, perhaps motor neurone disease, a whole clutch of illnesses, certainly AIDS itself, are the result of an immune system which has been terribly impaired by modern pollutions, by modern society, by all the toxins around us which we can't avoid in the air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we eat. We are a poison race today, you could say, effectively, and our immune systems have suffered terribly in consequence. Well, modern Western medicine doesn't have an answer for that, but there are lots of herbs that can do that. The whole of Chinese medicine is about the strengthening of the immune system, and I think this is one aspect of herbal medicine which is going to make it increasingly attractive to doctors as well as to patients in the future. I think there's a number of factors uh, influencing public uh, interest here. First of all, herbs are natural, and there's a 
philosophical predisposition toward preferring natural products. There is also the myth that since something is natural, it's presumed to be safe, although that's not always true. Some of the most uh, violent toxins known to humankind come from the plant kingdom. Mark Blumenthal in Austin, Texas, publishes Herbal Gram magazine and is executive director of the American Botanical Council, a leading herbal medicine education organization. There also is the perception among the public that herbs are, in general, safer, gentler, and lower cost than their prescription or conventional drug counterparts, and some surveys indicate that that is, in fact, the case. Herbs do work gently. They are, in fact, generally safe, and they are usually lower cost than conventional drugs. Herbal remedies are often less expensive for a reason. Unlike synthetic pharmaceutical drugs, plant medicines occur naturally and thus do not require hundreds of millions of dollars to develop and test for government approval. Physician Andrew Weil. You know, there are some herbal preparations that are pricey. Ginseng is an expensive herb, for example. But in general, if you've talked to anyone recently who's had a prescription filled, uh, a common response is that they're just astounded when they got the bill. You know, for some of these uh, prescription medications that cost a daily dose maybe uh, 3 or 4 or $5 a day or more. You know, these are very expensive products. And uh, I think in general, the herbal medicines are much less costly than pharmaceutical drugs. I'd say a quarter of the cost or less. So for, say, an elderly person on a tight budget who might need uh, medicine, that could be a substantial... Could be drug. very substantial, even for a younger person. You know, the, the cholesterol-lowering drugs that we have today, uh, things like Lovastatin, Mevacor, these are very expensive. There is a, an herbal alternative from Ayurvedic medicine, the medicine of India, a plant called Google. Uh, funny name, G-U-G-G-U-L, which you can now get in health food stores. There's good research from India demonstrating its cholesterol-lowering effects, probably by a mechanism similar to the ones that uh, of our pharmaceutical drugs, but it's safer, and it's a fraction of the cost of the pharmaceutical drugs. As a graduate of Harvard Medical School and also as a Harvard-educated botanist, Dr. Weil knows about plant remedies and discusses them in depth in his book, Natural Health, Natural Medicine but he is still a rarity among doctors who today receive little or no training in herbal treatment. That gap in knowledge frustrates another MD who practices herbal medicine, Howard Posner in Philadelphia. Many patients who I see have been to several doctors, often a myriad of physicians who have given them a myriad of drugs, which produced a myriad of side effects, sometimes rather harsh side effects, Often they've gotten second- and third-line drugs to treat the side effects of the preceding drugs, and their symptoms may have been suppressed, but they realize that they have not been relieved of their illness. They've had some suppression. Another reason is that they're unhappy with the way their physician treated them. Often I hear complaints that their doctor treated them in a very condescending way, got upset if they asked questions, brushed aside their concerns about the medication that's being prescribed and poo-pooed any suggestion that there might be an alternative. More and more patients seek out herbal treatment because they find it safer and gentler. Many turn to naturopathic doctors, who are not licensed medical doctors, but who receive a formal four-year training in herbal and natural medicine. Naturopathic doctor Mary Bove is certified in both the United States and in England, where she is a licensed medical herbalist. The daughter of a medical doctor, she practices in Brattleboro, Vermont. My pediatric population, the children that come to the office, often those children are coming because they've been in a, a chronic state of illness, meaning that they've had recurrent ear infections or recurrent eczema or recurrent asthma or recurrent um, upper respiratory infections, and that they've been on antibiotics, you know, maybe over the winter three, four, five times, and the the parents are getting concerned. They come off the antibiotics, they're right back on in two or three weeks. And so they're looking to break the cycle to try to find an alternative to this, to try to build up the, the child's body again and to try to avoid that reoccurrence of antibiotic use. Um, adults who come, probably the three most common reasons adults come into the practice, one is um, women for female medicine, either for menstrual irregularities or menopausal complaints. 
Um, secondly, gastrointestinal. I see a lot of gastrointestinal, so digestive upset, be it heartburn, be it um, uh, colon or um, bowel disease or maldigestion, but you, you'll often find that. And then I'd say the last thing would be um, allergies, uh, which could be asthma, which could be eczema, which could be psoriasis, which could be hay fever type of symptoms. But that's another reason why I see a lot of people. Of course, these kinds of symptoms can be presented to conventional uh, physicians, medical doctors. Why is it that, that the folks end up in your office? Um, often they've been through um, conventional medicine. They've been to several doctors. They felt like they've gotten nowhere. Um, sometimes they are on a drug that they find that they have a, an, <clears throat> um, a side effect that they don't want to have. I had a woman in this morning who had... Uh, problems with depression um, from taking estrogen and so she wanted to get off of that because of that reason per se. Also I think that the, the public is being more educated on the role of defense in the immune system and keeping the body healthy and a lot of people who are on the standard pharmaceutical drugs feel like they're only doing the band-aid approach and they're finding that they want to try to get more to the root of the problem. Sometimes in herbal medicine the root is the solution. That was the case 11 years ago for Jerry McLean in Boston. When I first got into it, it was through my acne condition. I was uh, on medication, tetracycline, and um, only antibiotics, but nothing on a herbal or a natural line. And for how long had you tried the antibiotics? Oh, it must have been uh, two years. You were, you were on antibiotics for yeah, two years? Yeah, the doctor said I had the worst acne he's ever seen in my life. Hmm. And after I paid a good amount of money, then he said there was nothing else he could do for me. So I just got so upset about it that I just said, well, let me start reading about herbs. And I got so interested in herbs. And I met a woman in a health food store, and I had a comment. I said, you have such a lovely face. And she said, my face used to look like yours. I said, well, well thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and so... Um, she said, um, "She said, no, but seriously, she says, I can do something for your face. And she, we started, started reading about herbs, and she gave me this one herb to try, and I could just see my pimples shrinking. What was the herb that helped your face? Echinacea. Hmm. And echinacea is one of the king of the blood purifiers, so it cleans your blood. You didn't apply that topically. You, you swallowed it? Yeah, you swallow it. You, uh, it comes in drops. And you put it about 20 drops in some water, a small amount of water, and you drink it down about three times a day. And for how long did you try this treatment? Uh, that worked on me right away. It um, must have been about four days. From there, I just started studying on my own. I put echinacea, I put a golden seal, I put dandelion and burdock, and those are a lot of blood purifiers. And golden seal is an antibiotic, one of the highest antibiotics in the um, herbal kingdom. The personal success Jerry McLean says he had from herbal treatment prompted him to begin counseling others on the benefits of botanical medicine. A member of his church congregation, John Moran, decided to give it a try. Well, uh, I guess you could call it worst-case scenario. Uh, I had multiple uh, medical problems. Um, I was um, a karate instructor and a bodybuilder. And uh, through uh, a number of injuries and accidents and actually more chronic stress to the uh, bones and uh, ligaments and muscles over time, I developed a lot of scar tissue and became very inactive uh, as a result, which led to further problems. But then um, <clears throat> I also had severe respiratory problems, chronic chest, sinus, and ear infections. And when I say severe and chronic, I'm, uh, for example, I was on antibiotics for two weeks, off for two weeks, on for two weeks, off for about 15 years. Combined with a lot of aspirin I was taking for my aches and pains, I developed ulcers. My life had become uh, almost unlivable physically. John Moran began a regimen of botanical medicines, including echinacea, golden seal, dandelion, and burdock, intended to purify his body of toxins that had accumulated. It made sense to cleanse myself out and to build back up. I said, well, at least it's worth a try. I mean, I've tried everything else. He gave me the cleansing. The first few days, I felt like a, a new man. I just, 
everything was moving in my body, whatever, and I, I felt so wonderful. It's hard to explain. And uh, you, I, I went from eliminating maybe once every few days to eliminating uh, two, three times a day. I said, wow, this is tremendous. And then after that, I didn't feel well. I felt, I called, I said, I feel really sick. I've got pains, aches and pains. And Jerry explained, it's the, it's, you know, it's the uh, cleansing process can be painful at times. And so I've gone back and forth, back and forth, where um, I've been working with Jerry and the Herbs for about a year and a few months now. My health situations in every category have improved tremendously. But that's not to say it hasn't been an up and down struggle. And how do you feel now? I feel uh, better than I've ever felt. Um, he gives me herbs that are natural anti-inflammatories. I was in so much pain, uh, I couldn't move my arms more than about four or five inches away from my body. Now I can move, lift them above my head. I couldn't drive a car. Now I, I bought a car, and I'm driving. I can do. My, I couldn't even wash dishes. Uh, just the shoulder improvement in my shoulders alone has been miraculous. John, do you still see your regular physician? I think it's it's only prudent and wise to get regular checkups and and see your doctors. But I think the focus here uh, is that for many ailments that we we have alternatives that we can use a combination of of doctors and Western medicine. And there's some things that they do better than anyone else. If you're in a car accident, you don't want to be anywhere but in an emergency room. Uh, if you need a certain surgery, you want the best surgeon. But for many chronic common problems. Um, the naturally occurring elements found in herbs and plants uh, can be as, as effective, if not more effective, than the uh, synthesized chemical uh, elements made by pharmaceuticals with very little or no side effects. You're listening to The Medicine Garden. I'm David Freudberg. In our next half hour, a look at which herbs are commonly used for which health conditions and a discussion with medical experts on whether botanical remedies are safe. If you'd like to order a copy of The Medicine Garden on audio cassette tape to review the information on herbal remedies, please call toll-free 1-800-5-LISTEN. That's 1-800-5-L-I-S-T-E-N. Thank you. This is PRI, Public Radio International. Welcome back to the Medicine Garden. I'm David Freudberg. Some people swear by the natural curative properties of certain plants when brewed up into an herbal tea or extracted into a liquid tincture. But what better medicine is there than just sitting quietly among plants and flowers, drinking in their unabashed festival of color? There's a lot of, um, right now, yellows, pinks, orange, a bit of red, purples, In the spring, it tends to be a lot of blues and whites because I have a lot of the native woodland wildflowers, which there's a lot of blues and whites and a little bit of yellow. So the color combination really changes throughout the season. Heather McCargo in Carlisle, Massachusetts, is a plant lover both by profession and by hobby. In her own New England backyard, she cultivates fragrant herbs, edible flowers, and a peaceful environment. Probably the best part to me about working in my garden is I'm totally in the present. You know, most of us stressed out Americans, and even working as a professional horticulturalist, I get stressed out. You are spend a lot of time either worrying about something in the future that's about to happen or something you did or said in the past. And when I'm in my garden, I'm totally in the here and now. It's almost like meditating or doing yoga. You know, you're focused on the present and on the activity that I'm doing, and there's so much central experience both of my body you know doing the physical work and you know rubbing up against the plants and the birds and butterflies that go by that's a big part of the pleasure for me you mentioned that gardening for you is restful 
does it become a kind of therapy? Oh, definitely. And one of the things that I love most in my garden, I have a lot of a lot of fragrant plants. Like if you rub your hand on this, this is spearmint, which you know smells wonderful. Not to mention being able to make herb teas on it. And I have some scented geraniums over here, which are the rose scented geraniums that also smell wonderful when you rub up against it. Also, the sound of the wind, especially on what was once the lawn and is now a field, the wind swaying the grass is really beautiful on a windy day and interesting to look at. Your garden is designed so there are four pathways, uh, each strewn with uh, chips of wood that uh, lead into the center and it sort of shapes it in quadrants. Yeah, and the reason I've done that is it's a traditional herb garden shape to have four quadrants. It goes back to Persia, I believe, where the, each quadrant represents, one represents the sun, air, water, and fire. The different elements. The different elements. And I have at the center of the garden a sundial. And again, that was just um, sort of an orma- ornamental thing, but also has, you know, it's traditionally done in an herb garden, and the one I have is just a reproduction from Williamsburg, and it will tell you roughly what time of day it is, if you even care to know when you're out in the garden. Calming though the garden is, Many of us in this technological age have grown apart from nature, from its graceful rhythms and restorative powers. We seem to have forgotten how nature disperses healing treasures in the leaves and flowers, the barks and roots of the herbal kingdom. Before the era of pharmaceutical drugs, our ancestors picked their medicines from the forests and the fields. In today's pre-packaged world, many of us would have little idea of where to begin with healing plants. So I invited Mark Blumenthal, who heads the American Botanical Council, to take me on a quick tour of the herbal section of a health store. We're opening this jar up, and let's see if you can smell anything. Sometimes people say this smells like dirty socks. This is valerian, the root of valerian plant. It's a very effective, gentle, safe, nighttime sleep aid. does not interact with alcohol and does not cause uh, dependence like barbiturates. And so this is a safe, gentle, effective nighttime sleep aid approved in Germany, France, other countries for its benefits. But this is a non-addictive sleep aid. Non-addictive sleep aid. It doesn't synergize with alcohol at all. Now here's the interesting one. Chase tree berries. You see these little little, little round uh, gray uh, little berries here? You formerly call monk's pepper. It's been popular in Europe since the Greek or Roman times uh, for women's complaints, for dysmenorrhea and, and difficult menstruation. And the extracts are becoming more popular over here in the States for uh, young women to use for painful menstruation or irregular menstruation. So, And, and would one. you put these little berries in hot water and brew this up as a tea? Uh, I'm not of the gender that finds this uh, very compelling for me personally, but there's other herbs here probably that I as a man approaching 50 would probably want to take, like saw palmetto berries. That's useful in prostate-related problems? That's right. Uh, the prost- especially the, uh, the extract of saw palmetto has been found in, uh, in several clinical studies to actually increase the flow of urine, reduce uh, the amount of retained urine, and reduce the, no- my- the, the amount of no- nighttime urination or the interruption of sleep that characterizes uh, benign prostatic hyperplasia, the uh, non-cancerous swelling of the prostate gland that cuts off the urethra. A problem very common in middle-aged men. Of course, the number one pharmaceutical drug, Proscar, which is being promoted for this, costs about two and a half dollars a day for a tablet. Uh, Two capsules of saw palmetto extract, the standardized extract, costs around 70 to 86 cents a day, one-third or so of the cost. Let's see if we can find that on the shelf here. Okay, on the upper shelf, these these are dark brown berries. Now, these berries are the size of, look like a a big olive pit, right? They look like the size of an olive pit. They're oblong, like an olive pit. And I'm going to go ahead and eat one, and I'll be glad to pay for it. It's the fruit of a dwarf palm tree called the saw palmetto and actually has a kind of a waxy, salty taste, not real tasty from 
from conventional standards. But we'll see it inside. I'm eating it, but it's not bad. Of course, herbalists are known to be kind of people that eat all kinds of stuff with bitter, acrid, pungent taste. So herbalists... Medicine doesn't have to taste good. No, no, it's bad. The, the, worse, the worse it tastes, the better it is for you, right? Here's an herb called uh, feverfew. This is a jar of organic feverfew. Right. Now, in England, there was three clinical studies published showing that the use of feverfew leaf actually reduce the severity and duration of migraine headaches and actually can be useful in preventing migraines. In Canada, the government has approved an over-the-counter drug product made of feverfew leaf for migraine headache prophylaxis or prevention. Here's a jar of gota cola root. What is that? Well, it says gota cola root, but you'll notice that the look at this thing. This is not the root at all. This is mislabeled. This is obviously the leaf. So we already have a mislabeled product here, unfortunately. And, you know, it, it's fairly benign. But it's just one of those situations where somebody was just not being very careful. Uh, this is an herb that has been used in uh, Ayurvedic medicine for increasing mental concentration and uh, memory, according to traditional medicine. And in Europe, gota cola extracts are used in some areas for their external uses as well because it helps promote wound healing. So there's a whole line of products, uh, I think, in France that is made from the extract of this leaf, and it's useful for skin conditions, increasing skin elasticity, uh, wound healing, etc. Hawthorne? Hawthorne. There's a good one. Here's a great one, Hawthorne. Now, Hawthorne is the, this is the berry. Now, in German... In Germany and France, they use the hawthorn berry, the leaf, and the flower. It contains flavonoids, and it's a superior heart tonic. It's quite safe. There's no adverse reactions, no, no bad side effects, and it's eaten like a food because hawthorn, in England, they make hawthorn berry jams and jellies. So it's almost quite safe as a food, tasty, and uh, it's useful for heart uh, arrhythmias, uh, bradycardia, or ho- slow heartbeat. Also can be useful for um, uh, cardiac insufficiency uh, that does not yet require digitalis therapy in Germany. They use it with or without digitalis, and they also use it for uh, angina pectoris, or the pressure in the, in the, in the chest. It's a, a function of uh, uh, heart condition. So this is a very popular herbal remedy. It's quite safe. Many loose herbs, especially flowers and leaves, deteriorate when stored in jars or even tea bags and can quickly lose their potency. That's why herbalists prefer either the fresh plant or extracts of the plant, which are then preserved in such substances as alcohol or vegetable glycerin. The techniques used to select plants and to withdraw medicine from them have been refined to an art by Hyde's Herbal Clinic in the college town of Leicester, England. John Hyde is a third-generation medical herbalist. My father, who was here for 60 years before me, he taught us as children what herbs to pick, and we used to go down to the canal banks, and we used to take the old car down on a Saturday afternoon, and uh, we had a large hessian sack each, my brother, my sister and I, we'd be each given a particular species of plant to, uh, to collect and we'd have to take the sack back to father every sort of 20 minutes to get him to vet it to make sure we'd not pick the wrong things and uh, earned a little bit of extra pocket money that way. So I started herbalism, you know, as a little boy, picking plants. And what kinds of plants or flowers would you uh, collect from the countryside? Well, for example, uh, dandelion. The humble dandelion, marvellous for urinary problems. Uh, It's an anti-inflammatory. Daisies, all the daisy family. Um, Matricaria, camomellum. Um, The nettle. The stinging nettles. Urtica dioica. A blood purifier that has quite a remarkable effect on, um, on eczema and on psoriasis. John Hyde's family roots in herbal medicine date back to the turn of the 20th century, when his grandparents operated a small post office as part of their general store on a side street of Leicester. Customers could buy small packets of dried herbs. People would come in and ask my grandfather if he had something for this or for that or for the other. Sore throat, tummy ache, arthritis, headache, and so on. So he thought to himself... I'd better do some learning so that I give people the right sort of advice. And so he started making tinctures and so on until he'd got a mini 
pharmacy going with herbal substances in it. And so people were now coming to the post office for herbal treatment and not for stamps or postal orders or anything else. That went out of the window virtually. And he got so many patients that he had to move. And he started in 1908 Hyde's Clinic. The old postmaster's son, Frederick Fletcher Hyde, pursued a scientific understanding of herbal medicine and graduated with honors in botany from London University. He thus enlarged the family herbal practice as John Hyde recalled from his own childhood. When we opened the front door, there would be dozens of patients queued outside, all down our path, down the wall across the front of the building and down in front of the shops and down the London Road, two and three deep. So we were brought up in that whole milieu of herbal medicine. We used to make all our own ointments. We used to get purified beeswax and boil leaves, and they'd be boiling in big saucepans on the back of the stove for probably 48 hours. This is in the kitchen, in our home, and this smell of sort of burnt leaves and herbal aromas would pervade. You were trying to do your homework, (laughs) coughing and spluttering. And... uh, Yes, so you could say I'm a dyed-in-the-wool herbalist in more ways than one. Today, John Hyde and co-workers carry on the tradition of preparing herbal remedies for patients with all manner of ailments. We'll just go through the door here and upstairs and show you something interesting, hopefully. Uh, In the realms that many patients don't get to see... Right, here we are. I think you've probably noticed a certain smell, a lovely aroma in the air. As if we had just walked into a beautiful springtime garden. Right. And that is the combined aroma of the volatile oils of some 500 herbs, which we keep um, in this stock room. Now, this is the Gorelicals, um, named after the... Famous Greek physician Galen. You're quite right. That's the chap, and his name has been immortalised on our door. Uh, We're looking here at um, a number of shelves, and stacked on them, right up to the ceiling, are numerous large glass bottles containing about five litres per bottle of brown and light brown and greenish and yellow and various coloured liquids... And the liquids are the, uh, the actual alcohols and waters in which the herbs are being soaked in the first stage of preparing a tincture, which is the liquid substance produced from the original plant or herb. And so um, I'll just take one of these off the shelf here. And just undo the lid. And in there... My word, that's wonderful. Uh, I think you, you might even think that was, um, what? Uh, it smells a bit like wine. Jack Daniels? Well, here we are. Populus Gilead. A wonderful plant for soothing the membranes of the throat. I took that down just by uh, at random. And over here, a large press. Stainless steel press. The herb is poured into this press. And there we have all the soaked herb in the bottom of the press. And then it's a matter of placing a pressure plate on that herb. Here we go. And that is then placed under the press. And then pressure is applied. And we'll leave that there for two or three hours for that huge tonnage to exert on the herb and so express absolutely every ounce of moisture from the woody, pulpy substance that's been soaked. And all the goodness, all the medicinal action is now trapped in that life-giving liquid, the herbal tincture, which is what I use to prescribe. All right, let us now head back downstairs. Right. 
We made our way to the dispensary, which was lined with botanical tablets, ointments, creams, pastes, and suppositories, many containing a combination of medicinal herbs. The rows and rows of these preparations suggest that the tradition of Hyde's Herbal Clinic remains alive and well nearly a century after it was founded. The patients who prefer this type of natural health care apparently believe it meets their standards. But is plant-based medicine truly safe? Less than 2% of the patients I treat have side effects to the botanical medicines I give them. Naturopathic physician Mary Bove in Brattleboro, Vermont. Every individual is different, and how the individual would process the plant is going to be different, and that there are different tolerances within that. But generally, for the dose that's prescribed, which is a moderate, you know, medium-sized dose, you find few side effects from that. But this reported low level of side effects from herbs is a hard pill to swallow for physician Robert Temple, who helps to evaluate drugs for the U.S. government's Food and Drug Administration, or FDA. In typical clinical studies of uh, drugs, conventional drugs, uh, people are on the lookout for any adverse effect. And it's common to see adverse effects occurring in 25, 50 percent of people not only on the medicine but on placebo. So it's inconceivable to me that uh, plant-derived materials aren't associated with the same kinds of rashes that uh, other, other materials are because even drugs that relatively rarely cause a rash cause a rash sometimes. Well, nobody is saying that herbs don't have side effects. This would be a very ignorant and stupid thing to say. But undoubtedly, properly prescribed and properly prepared, herbal medicine generally has a far, far higher safety threshold than drugs do, and quite often there are no known side effects at all. Herbal historian Barbara Griggs believes that today's medical establishment is biased in favor of pharmaceutical drugs and has not carefully considered the scientific evidence for plant-based medicine. She points out that pharmaceuticals often consist of a single highly concentrated chemical. It's potent and can produce potent side effects. By contrast, many botanical medicines are milder in their effects. Nature dilutes the medicinal agents in a plant with inactive materials like cellulose and chlorophyll, and so the side effects of herbs, if any, are also likely to be more gentle. Physician and botanist Andrew Weil. I have relied greatly on botanical preparations in for the past uh, 13, 14, 15 years of my own practice. For every prescription I write for a pharmaceutical drug, I probably give out 40 or 50 recommendations for botanicals. In those years that I've been doing that, I have never seen a single serious adverse reaction to any plant preparation I've given a patient. I have seen one or two rashes, I've seen one or two cases of stomach upsets, and I've told people to discontinue the the preparations. But that is insignificant compared to what you see with pharmaceutical preparations. And I think this is also the experience of most people I know who use herbal preparations. And you First of all, you want to find out about what are the plants that are toxic, that might be toxic. Uh, and then if you avoid those and are careful about them uh, and give plants for which there's good data on efficacy and safety, I think the risks are very low. They're not zero, but they're very low. And the important question is what are they relative to the use of pharmaceutical drugs? So we're looking at the question of relative safety, and I think there's, there's no contest there. I think it's ironic that people are so concerned with the potential dangers of herbs, which have been used for thousands of years, when there are so many things that we can buy over the counter that are potentially dangerous. Physician Howard Posner in Philadelphia. The average herb, I'd say, would have a less than a one in a hundred chance of even a mild side effect that would disturb the patient. Whereas with the average over-the-counter drug, you're, you're dealing with, you know, probably a 25 to 35 percent chance of a side effect that will disturb the patient to the point of wondering, why is this happening? Where is it coming from? And what can I do to stop it? 
And the risk of adverse reactions from some prescription medicines is even higher, according to Dr. Andrew Weil. Not only is it high, but the kinds of effects are severe. They include death, for example, and permanent disability. You tend not to see that with herbal medicine. All I can say is that I think any dedicated patient in conventional medicine is sooner or later going to experience an adverse drug reaction. I am very upset at the widespread prescribing of steroids, uh, often for trivial conditions. Uh, These are very powerful hormones that have uh, widespread toxic effects, and people are sometimes maintained on them for months and years for treatment of conditions like uh, rheumatoid arthritis, asthma. They become dependent on them. The toxicity of them is terrible. Just things like cortisone? Yeah, prednisone. Sure. The drugs that are commonly used to treat high blood pressure uh, have very significant toxic effects. Um, You know, but I think almost any major category you pick of drugs that are used by conventional doctors, the risks of toxicity are very significant. And the kinds of effects include some that are very, very bad. The frequency of adverse reactions by patients who take prescription drugs is startling. Just among older Americans, some 10 million cases of negative drug reactions occur each year, according to the Public Citizen Health Research Group affiliated with Ralph Nader. And one report calculated that over 600,000 of these cases resulted in hospitalizing the patient. Thus, many health consumers are prompted to explore alternatives, like herbal medicine, where side effects are widely regarded as rare. To say that side effects are rare just can't I just don't believe that's going to turn out to be true when you study them carefully. Dr. Robert Temple of the FDA. It may be that severe side effects are rare, but even that, you know, we've, we've, we've encountered serious liver injury from uh, a number of plants that, from, from chaparral and things like that that were used. They're, they're herbals, but they wipe out your liver sometimes. Chaparral, also known as creosote, is a strong-smelling desert bush growing in the southwestern United States and Mexico. Long used medicinally by Native Americans, it has been widely taken for ailments ranging from rheumatism to cancer. In the early 1990s, to the surprise of many experts, chaparral poisoning was reported in a handful of cases. To be on the safe side, the herb industry then voluntarily withdrew the product. But chaparral poses an enigma for Professor Varro Tyler, the herbal specialist at Purdue. Chaparral is a very difficult uh, matter uh, to uh, decide upon because uh, chaparral has been sold by the ton in this country for many, many years, and uh, uh, it was uh, recently shown to have caused uh, uh, four cases, I believe, one of them very serious, of liver damage, uh, jaundice, and uh, the one case was so serious that it required a liver transplant. Uh, These were attributed to chaparral. But what about all of those thousands of other persons who had been taking these tons of chaparral for some years and who had not demonstrated these reactions? Is it possible that particular batch was adulterated in some way? It certainly could have been. But in the interim, I would not recommend that consumers purchase it until that matter is straightened out. From his position as former dean at the Purdue School of Pharmacy and Pharmacal Sciences, Dr. Tyler prefers to err on the conservative side. His book, Herbs of Choice, identifies some 80 botanical medicines that do satisfy him as generally safe and effective. But he finds that certain other plants should not be swallowed as medicine. Things like comfrey, coltsfoot, sassafras, certain kinds of calamus, all of those things are on the shelves today in some of the shops that sell herbal products. And uh, they, are, they are not safe for human internal consumption. I think probably the one that I'm most cautious about is comfrey. Physician Andrew Weil. I can't see any reason why people would want to take comfrey internally. Uh, I use it externally as a poultice. Uh, it's very useful for stubborn kinds of wounds that won't heal, like uh, the bites of brown recluse spiders and uh, diabetic ulcers and bed sores. It's a useful treatment in that way. But I can't see any reason why people should take it internally, and I see still comfrey products in health food stores. Because the plant kingdom is so vast, featuring a spectrum from powerful medicines to lethal poisons, it's impossible to declare all herbs as entirely harmless or harmful. 
but can we see the herbal forest for the trees? The consensus of most health experts we spoke with is that authentic herbal medicines, when taken according to the recommended dose, generally are as safe as, if not safer than, pharmaceutical drugs. In the event an herbal product is determined to be actually dangerous, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration may yank it from the shelves. It generally has not done so with herbs, according to FDA physician Robert Temple. We get relatively few reports from over-the-counter drugs or over-the-counter herbs because there's no, there's no requirement for anybody to report them. Also, the impression, you ha- this may be changing, but the impression one, we, one has is that uh, physicians who are the primary reporters to these systems uh, don't take a very good uh, history of, uh, of alternative medicine uh, treatment, so they may well not know. If the people who have the reactions are not in contact with the medical system or if the medical system doesn't know enough to ask about them, you could miss a lot. Now, do I think there's some scourge in the community that's killing many hundreds of thousands of people? No, of course I don't. It's unlikely that anything like that is going on. Also, however, if you look at the world literature as far as the the use of herbal medicines on the increase and the toxicology of herbs and the adverse reaction reports at various countries, poison control centers and hospital emergency rooms and their uh, adverse reaction reporting systems, you find that the incidence of adverse reactions to properly prepared legitimate commercial herbal medicines and phytomedicines simply is very, very low, especially like, for instance, in the Western Europe, where these things are properly regulated and where they have excellent adverse reaction reporting systems. There simply is a very low, less than 1% uh, adverse reactions. A finding by the UN's World Health Organization does show that worldwide, herbs account for less than 1% of reported negative reactions to medicine and that pharmaceutical drugs account for almost all negative reactions to medicine. But if you're drawn to herbal remedies because they're mild and time-tested, it's only wise first to learn about them in detail and to consult a qualified health care provider in case of a serious medical condition. In our next program, the truly fascinating history of herbal medicine, and experts will explain which botanical remedies are most scientifically proven today. This lush rainforest in Peru's Amazon jungle grows so densely as to hide many of its natural wonders and riches. The vast tropical vegetation yields a cornucopia of edible plants, timber, firewood, and botanical medicines, some long used by native populations. About 80,000 different species of plants grow here. Nobody knows for sure how many, and only a small fraction have been scientifically studied. Medical botanists believe that in the thick jungle growth, nature may have camouflaged powerful cures for human diseases. In this program, you'll learn about the truly fascinating history of herbal remedies and how they're used today to treat ailments from the common cold to serious medical conditions. Welcome back to The Medicine Garden. I'm David Freudberg. My interest in herbal medicine really uh, started uh, at the time I I was a family doctor in a small rural town in California. Physician David Katz, now in Sacramento, California. I did everything from delivering babies to taking care of people in their later years and uh, when they were dying. The um, thing that I noticed was that many people wouldn't take the standard medical treatments, so even though I knew that I could get rid of the symptoms that they were coming for. They weren't willing to do the treatment that I wanted because of the side effects that they got. Uh, Another group of people didn't get better from the standard treatments. For instance, if we looked at allergies, they uh, took all the antihistamines that I had to offer them, either couldn't tolerate them or didn't get better, even went to the allergist, may have tried allergy shots uh, and that didn't make them better either. So they were back and they were asking for something else. 
So I began to look at what other types of treatments were available. Dr. Katz decided to explore herbal medicines because they are natural and often are more gentle on the body than highly concentrated pharmaceutical drugs. An example is a plant-based remedy used with patients suffering from prostate problems. There is a treatment that actually one of my colleagues at work introduced me to uh, with sawgrass, which is an herb, which does help urine to flow more freely and helps the uh, prostate to not interfere with urine flow during the night so that the person can truly empty their bladder and not have to get up over and over again. I don't believe medical science really understands exactly how it works, but for many men, it does work. Sawgrass, often called saw palmetto, is an increasingly popular plant remedy. Public interest in herbal medicine is surging. Natural botanicals recently became the fastest growing sector of the American pharmacy industry. In drugstores like this one outside Boston, medicinal plants are now widely available in powdered form and in extracts prepared as liquid tinctures, tablets, teas, cough drops, and ointments. Natural remedies like garlic, echinacea, ginseng, and dozens of other herbs are now commonly sold. Dr. Varro Tyler in West Lafayette, Indiana, was longtime dean of the pharmacy school at Purdue University. It has become mainstream. It's very popular. People want to know about it. And uh, it, it is really going to, I think, increase even more. Why is it increasing? Modern medicine is to some extent distrusted. It's high cost, difficulty of access, the fact that it can't cure everything, neither can herbs, of course. But all of those things account for some distrust of modern medicine, so people want to try something else. Uh, in addition, uh, herbal products are usually milder, both in their effects and in their side effects, and people like that in comparison to synthetic chemical agents. Another strong appeal of herbal remedies is their low cost. Affordability may bring botanical medicine into greater future acceptance. One of the big facts about healthcare in the late 20th century is that it is phenomenally expensive. And one of the most expensive parts of any healthcare budget nationally or for a hospital or for a community is the drug bill. It is huge. And one of the obvious answers is herbs. Health writer Barbara Griggs in London. The cost to the hospital or the patient that uses them is going to be much, much lower than a drug because millions and millions and millions haven't been spent on developing them. I mean, herbs are there for everyone to use. Garlic, for instance, is an extremely good example. There are plenty of drugs on the market now that are prescribed for high blood pressure, and few of them are as effective, and none of them has fewer side effects than garlic. So garlic would be a very, very cheap medicine. Food medicines like garlic are generally recognized as safe. And while some plants found in nature definitely are poisonous, properly prepared herbal medicines, if taken according to the recommended dose, are usually as safe as, if not safer than, pharmaceutical drugs. Professor Varro Tyler of Purdue. The uh, agencies that collect data from the poison control centers regarding poisoning by all kinds of, uh, of products ranging from household cleansers to uh, medicines put uh, poisoning by plants in the absolute last category in terms of frequency. And that would include the reported frequency of poisoning by herbal remedies. It is extremely infrequent in the United States. If herbs are relatively harmless and relatively cheap, where exactly do they fit into the repertoire of medical choices available to us? Physician Andrew Weil in Tucson, Arizona, is best-selling author of Spontaneous Healing. I would like to see informed health care consumers uh, who know when and when not to use standard medicine. In general, you use standard medicine for crises, you know, for things that are really severe. Uh, the problem is if you go to standard medicine with everything, with all the common complaints, I think you're likely to be treated with, especially with drugs that can be toxic, expensive, and you fail to get the benefit of simpler remedies 
uh, that most doctors simply are not trained in. You know, there's a lot of conditions out there for which there are simple, inexpensive remedies, many of them herbal, uh, that could be tried before you use the strong, expensive stuff. Dr. Weil says plant-based medicines can be helpful for certain moderate ailments, such as the common cold, allergies, skin conditions, and gastrointestinal disorders, as well as for some chronic maladies, like arthritis and cardiovascular conditions, where the patient wishes to avoid a prolonged regimen of synthetic drugs with unpleasant side effects. Plants, as nature designed them, often contain lower doses of medicine than do pharmaceuticals, And so, while herbs are frequently easier on your system, satisfactory results may take a little longer with botanicals. The great attraction of herbal medicine is it is potentially everybody's. Medical herbalist Simon Mills at the University of Exeter in England. You can step outside any front door of any building in the world and you'll find three or four herbal remedies immediately accessible to you. Most of our grandparents had this ability. There was a basic understanding of plants in the past which we unfortunately have lost. The exact origins of herbal medicine will perhaps always remain as mysterious as nature itself. It is said that an ancient king suffering from leprosy retreated to the forest with his servant for a period of meditation and healing. There a holy flower descended from heaven, which when baked into a bread and eaten gave special powers. After consuming the bread, the servant became aware that the plants and trees around him began to speak each announcing its own special medicinal property. Using this knowledge, the king was cured. Thus, according to legend, was the knowledge of plant medicine revealed to humanity. I don't think any primitive tribe has ever been started which didn't use the herbs around it for medicine. It is the oldest medicine of mankind. Artifacts from antiquity found in present-day Iraq suggest that plants were used for their healing properties as long as 60,000 years ago. From 5,000 years ago, we have detailed written records of Chinese remedies using roots, barks, leaves, flowers, fruits, and seeds. The patient would brew up these ingredients into an herbal tea or perhaps crush the plants and apply them topically. Many of these herbal cures came to the West by way of the Middle East. Historian Barbara Griggs is author of Green Pharmacy. Rhubarb was one of the medicines, a great purgative and laxative, was introduced to the West from the Arabs. They also used a lot of the spices that they in turn borrowed from the Far East. So things like uh, ginger and cinnamon, uh, which have quite powerful medicinal uses, came to us through the Arabs as well. The ancient Roman armies, as they campaigned throughout Europe, brought with them knowledge of plant-derived drugs. The influential 2nd century physician Galen blended herbs into complex mixtures, such as a legendary concoction known as theriac. His medical authority, as well as the custom of producing theriac, would endure for some 1,500 years. Theriac was made with literally hundreds of herbs, some of which had to be picked in their prime, imported from Crete. Others had to be prepared in a special way. And just making theriac was actually a ceremony in Venice, which people went to see, rather as we might go to a, a rock concert. It was great entertainment. The, the manufacture of this extraordinarily powerful and complex medicine, which was supposed to be able to save a man from the plague if necessary. Throughout Europe in the Middle Ages, monasteries would cultivate herb gardens as the source of medicines dispensed by religious communities to the infirm. 
Literate monks followed instructions printed in herbals, the name for prescription books that listed healing plants and their uses. The books often sounded a spiritual note. There's always an acknowledgement that herbs are a gift of God, that they're part of a creation of which we are also part. It was a very holistic view. There's a sense that we're all involved. There's a, there's a macrocosm of which we are a part, and that stars, herbs, trees, fishes, all sorts of creatures and ourselves, all designed to work together. In olden times, when knowledgeable physicians were few and far between, botanical remedies that could be harvested in your backyard offered an accessible form of health care. But folk medicine could be inaccurate and sometimes vulnerable to outrageous quackery. That's how it appeared to the emerging class of university-trained doctors, all of them male, beginning in the 16th century. They dismissed many home-based herbal practices as old wives' tales. Clearly, there were many things done in the ancient world that were superstitious and had no scientific basis, but there were also some things done there that were very sensible. Physician Andrew Weil. There was a condition called dropsy, which was the accumulation of fluid in the lower extremities. We now call it edema. Uh, this was very common, and the major reason for it is heart failure. And conventional medicine had no treatment for it. But there were these wise women, or old wives in the countryside, uh, who were able to treat dropsy. They gave them herbal teas, and the chief constituent of it was foxglove leaf. And finally, a young English physician uh, was persuaded by his fiancée to visit one of these women in Shropshire who had a great reputation for curing dropsy, and he realized something interesting was going on there and got her tea and realized that the thing in it that was probably doing it was foxglove, and he wrote a paper called An Account of the Foxglove and its Medicinal Uses that made him the most famous physician in Europe and brought this plant into medicine. To get a feel for the historical use of botanical medicine, I took a tour of the Queen's Herb Garden outside London. It is the kind of day one often associates with England, a uh, little drizzly, a little gray, a little raw, but it's cheered by a pleasant companion, Laura Ponsonby, here at the Royal Botanic Gardens, often known as Kew Gardens, the world's largest botanic garden collection. Right, well, we've just arrived at this little Queen's Garden, which is behind a house which is known as the Dutch House, or Kew Palace. Once upon a time, King George III lived there, and it was, in fact, his mother who founded Kew Gardens in the 18th century. Uh, in front of us, we have a lovely bed of culinary herbs, and then in the main Nosegay Garden, which is a sunken garden, we've got lots of medicinal plants. Can you show us a few examples? Yes, of course. We'll just walk over here, shall we? Now, this is an interesting one. It's called comfrey, and the Latin name is symphytum. But here, we might think about the old English name, which is set bone or knit bone. And this was used for sprains and breaks. So it was very good for healing limbs and so on. And it was the root which was used. They smashed it up and made it like a sort of plaster and then put it round uh, whatever part needed to be uh, helped. A poultice. A poultice, yes. And interestingly, today, we do know that the plant contains something called allantoin, which has a power of healing tissue. So it's a good example of one which was used in the past, given a name because of its use. And today, it's not just what they call an old wise tale. There does seem to be quite a lot of truth in using uh, comfrey. Another one, one familiar, I think, to many people, is the rosemary. Rosemary which has got a, just a long line. This one's got a few yellow leaves as well. This is the common culinary spice rosemary. That's right, exactly. And it's got just a few little mauve flowers showing as well. That originally came from the Mediterranean. And the name rosemary, rosmarinus, meant it was the dew of the sea because very often that's where it really liked to grow, was near the seaside, so rosmarinus. And this one we use today, of course, as a culinary herb. But it was very valued for troubles of the brain, and it was said to improve the memory. And so uh, in Shakespeare, yeah, there is a quotation, isn't there? Rosemary, that's for remembrance. 
and some people have suggested that it wasn't just a sentimental remembrance, but perhaps it was in fact referring to um, the brain. And apparently in olden days when people were doing tests or exams, they used to wear either a little chaplet of rosemary or a rosemary sprig uh, behind the ear, and this improved the brain. <laughs> Would that it were so easy. Would that it were so easy indeed. Now another one which actually did work um, was willow. They said because willow grew in a wet place that it would be good for your rheumatics. You know, your, your rheumatics are always bad when it's a sort of cold and damp. And they actually found um, in the bark of willow salicylic acid, which of course is um, later synthesised with aspirin. So there, there was some truth in it. But so many plants in small amounts uh, are beneficial to us. Um, we'll probably see a foxglove a little bit later on. I mean, that's a very good example I often use to people. Very poisonous if you try to settle down to a, um, a dinner of foxglove leaves instead of a green veg. Um, that would be it. And even Agatha Christie's used it in some of her stories. But foxglove, of course, is used in heart troubles. And we'll be able to take a look at foxglove in a moment? Yes, we will indeed. Um, yes, now, this is amusing. Just along here, we've got a bench which has got chamomile on it. There's not very much at the moment, but in the 17th century and obviously earlier, life was not a very sweet one and everybody smelt terribly because they didn't wash and so on. And so when you came uh, with your friends and wanted to perhaps have some nice conversation on a nice day um, in the garden, really the best place was to sit on your chamomile seat you bruised it and up round you came this lovely smell and of course in England they used to have chamomile lawns if you go to Buckingham Palace um, and stole about on the Queen's lawns at the back you'll find that some of her lawn is not grass but it is of chamomile so that was an early lawn very often used. Now this is the same herb from which chamomile tea is made. That's exactly right the flowers of chamomile are used for making the tea and the other thing about interesting thing about chamomile is that one of its names was the plant's physician or the plant's doctor. And it was said that if you had a sickly plant in the garden, if you grew it near the chamomile, the chamomile had a wonderful beneficial effect on it and it perked up and did very well. So who knows, perhaps it might help. Well, we're just walking along and I do see, in fact, we have got foxglove just near us. We've got one of the white forms just next to us and there's the typical purple one very often you find when it's out you'll find a bee inside fox's glue is one of its names but that is a lifesaver really On the other side of the Atlantic, Europeans were discovering a new world where natives had long refined the natural art of healing with herbs. At the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy and Science, America's oldest pharmacy school, Professor Ara de Martirosian has studied the history of botanical medicine in North America. The American Indian up in uh, Maine, Penobscot, for example, uh, taught the settlers there how to use the uh, mayapple root extract on skin uh, cancers. It does actually work in, in topical uh, skin cancers. And here the American Indians were using this product. They taught us about the use of pine needles as a source of vitamin C. You know, we didn't know that. We didn't have the citrus fruits. So they were not getting uh, suffering from scurvy, whereas the settlers were because they wouldn't drink the pine needle tea, for example. It was considered too foreign. But then after a while, they began to realize we better pay attention to what they're reading because they're healthy. One of the things that impressed the settlers about the Indians when they first met them was what a splendid-looking people they were. I mean, it was, it was very impressive to the settlers that they saw very few Indians who squinted or were hunched-backed or who limped or were deformed. I mean, mostly they seemed to be very well-made people, very strong, with natural good health and fitness and sort of an athletic build. And the Indians had a, very, had a very wide knowledge of the herbs and roots that grew around them. There was blue flag, for instance, which was used by the Creek Indians as a cathartic, as a very, very powerful purge. The Albany Indians used it topically to apply to leg ulcers to make a poultice. Another plant which was 
very interesting to the settlers was, was a, a, pl- a plant called bone set, which quite a lot of tribes used to help them break a fever. And in fact, bone set produces quite a powerful sweat. Many plant medicines learned from the Native Americans remain widely used to this day, including echinacea, a popular natural remedy for colds. Even with the rise of chemical drugs that accelerated in the 1800s, botanical cures were common pharmacy items into the first part of the 20th century. Pharmacy professor Ara Dermartorosian. My grandfather was a pharmacist. Based on that background, I grew up in a pharmacy and during the 40s, 50s, or 60s in an old-time pharmacy, which was still making a lot of its preparations directly from scratch. And we had a thousand drawers full of every known drug there was, the powdered materials, leaf material, uh, standardized herbs, which were sold as teas. Uh, so I had that kind of background. And my grandfather, because he spoke about three or four languages, was able to handle a lot of questions of all the people of the Middle East who spoke either Armenian or Arabic or Turkish or Greek, and they were asking for a lot of these old-time remedies. Indeed, herbal medicine remains the dominant form of health care throughout the globe. The UN's World Health Organization estimates that today 80 percent of the Earth's population receives care through traditional medicine, of which plant remedies are a mainstay. The U.S. is unusual in its heavy reliance on pharmaceuticals, which often emphasize one potent synthesized drug, rather than the blend of gentler natural ingredients found in plants. Purdue University pharmacy professor Varro Tyler. Probably the United States is the single country in the world that has concentrated most on this single chemical entity magic bullet approach in comparison to almost all other countries. And that includes uh, industrially advanced nations such as England, France, Germany, Canada. I think that uh, this came about probably because of the patent situation, the financial, the economic side of things uh, that came along in the 1930s and perhaps early 1940s, but more in the 30s. And uh, did away with a lot of these older remedies that had been used for long periods of time. They were not necessarily ineffective, but none of them could be patented. And therefore, if they could be replaced with a single chemical entity that was a novel chemical compound and could be patented, then obviously the manufacturer was going to market that product, was going to advertise that product to physicians, because you can charge more for it, you can get a greater return for your stockholders. The largest botanical drug company in the United States, S.B. Penick, in its declining years in the 1950s was headed by a man named S. Barksdale Penick. And I, I remember a, vividly a conversation I had with him in New York one time, where his company was located, in which he lamented the fact that these products could not be patented. And he said his business was going downhill. Consequently, his firm was sold and, of course, now is no more. As botanical medicines disappeared from the shelves of drugstores, patients who didn't grow their own turned to health food shops as the supplier of healing herbs. And pharmacy schools, which at one time provided broad education in botanical medicine, began eliminating herbal courses from the curriculum. Thus, a new generation of neighborhood druggists in America had little knowledge of plant remedies, contrasting the picture in many European countries. I was in Germany a couple of years ago, and uh, one thing that I noticed, I was in Bavaria, all of the pharmacies that I saw had window displays that were 100% natural products. Physician Andrew Weil. Everything in the windows was natural products. It was valerian for sleep peppermint oil for irritable bowel syndrome, uh, ginkgo by Loba for improved blood circulation. I mean, all the products were that. And when you walked into these pharmacies, one of the first things that you saw was a big revolving rack of herbal teas. And the pharmacist would tell you what the teas were for and how to use them. You know, this is all true not only in Germany, it's true in France, it's true to some extent in Italy, certainly Switzerland, Austria. You know, this is a worldwide movement. We are being left in the dust by other countries. But in the United States, the tide has begun to turn. Herbal medicines are now resurfacing in many American pharmacies as over-the-counter remedies. 
Yet while at least a third of Americans are trying alternative health care techniques, including herbs, most do not tell their doctors, according to a survey in the New England Journal of Medicine. Patients apparently perceive that the medical profession frowns on natural therapies. I think medicine and botany have moved very, very far apart. Andrew Weil in Tucson, Arizona, is both a physician and a botanist. You know, at one time these were fields that were very closely allied, and today it's almost impossible to find people that speak the same language. Now, why this upsets me, I mean, not only does it make me an endangered species, but it seems to me it's a measure of the distance that has grown up between medicine and nature, and science and nature in general. And I find that very scary, because it seems to me that fundamentally healing is a natural process. A lot of my writing and work has been to try to direct people's attention to the innate nature of healing, the fact that the body heals itself and has that potential, and I think good medicine should build on that foundation. But there is a real sense in medicine today and in our society that nature is somehow the enemy, that we have to control it, uh, distance ourselves from it, and that leads us to think that when there's something wrong with us, we need outside intervention. And that's, I think, a reason that we have the kind of health care crisis that we do today, why we produce all the adverse reactions we do, why, you know, for many kinds of diseases, the kinds of treatments we have are so destructive and invasive and so reliant on technology. I think that's a big issue. You're listening to The Medicine Garden. I'm David Freudberg. In our next half hour, which botanical remedies actually work? And a look at the herbal medicine traditions of China and India. If you'd like to order a copy of the Medicine Garden on audio cassette tape to review the information on herbal remedies, please call toll free 1 800 5 Listen. That's 1 800 5 L I S T E N. Thank you. This is PRI Public Radio International. It's tea time here in the Medicine Garden. I'm David Freudberg, and today I'm steeping a cup of herbal tea. This is chamomile, often consumed as a mild relaxant to ease our passage through this harried world. Common herbal beverages are likely to have only minor health benefits, if any. But certain plants, when brewed up into a tea or extracted into a liquid tincture or tablet, are used for serious medical conditions— Some patients rely on herbs to treat ailments ranging from arthritis to high blood pressure to menopausal symptoms. These botanical remedies are growing in popularity because they can be less harsh on the body and in many cases cost less than high-tech chemical medicine. But today in the U.S., most physicians receive little or no training in herbal cures. When I was in medical school, it was ridiculed. Uh, Doctors and Teachers and my my fellow medical students and, and myself felt that uh, people were just fooling themselves. There, there was a placebo uh, effect that uh, would explain any improvement, or perhaps it was just chance. Uh, and yet the public continued to use herbs and other alternative therapies. Depending on your perspective, either a large sector of the public is simply wasting its time and money on worthless treatments, or most doctors are blindly ignoring evidence that natural therapies can be effective. The question seems to turn on how you prove whether a health care technique like herbal medicine is genuinely useful. Just because a practice is fashionable does not make it convincing to physicians like Robert Temple, who evaluates drugs for the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, or FDA. That doesn't impress me one way or the other. Um, Before conventional medicine learned how to study things properly, they believed in the wildest collection of, uh, of uh, interventions uh, that one could imagine, uh, leeches and bleeding and so on. And uh, although those were widely perceived as effective and were very popular, none of them worked. And now we know that. 
Throughout history, herbal medicine has offered a kind of refuge for patients steering clear of especially brutal treatments administered by conventional doctors. Gentle botanical remedies provided an alternative to such standard medical practices as blistering and prescribing toxic doses of mercury. Some modern-day patients turn to herbs, hoping to escape the irritating side effects sometimes produced by pharmaceutical drugs. Dr. David Katz. At least I can tell you what I have experienced in my own practice is that there are people who I have tried medical treatments uh, which are standard pharmaceuticals, and they have not tolerated any of them uh, for, for instance, high blood pressure, for chronic fatigue, for uh, sleep problems, and for uh, allergies like hay fever. And uh, they have gotten better on herbal preparations, whereas they could not tolerate the standard treatments. Mainstream medical science does not accept such experiences as conclusive evidence that herbal medicine works. Only clinical experiments that rule out any possible coincidences will satisfy the strict medical standards. In the case of herbs, these clinical trials generally have not been performed because they're so expensive. According to a government report, the average pharmaceutical drug now costs $238 million to develop and test. Drug companies cannot patent a naturally occurring plant and so have little incentive to invest in costly tests for herbal remedies. Thus, according to FDA physician Robert Temple, the effectiveness of herbs has not been proven. You can't say whether a therapy is useful or not unless you've done the studies that show that it is. And so when a physician chooses either a conventional medicine or a, an alternative type of medicine, uh, he has to have some idea based on good studies of whether it works or he can't possibly make the choice rationally. I, I should add one thing. Uh, I realize that many of the people who use these uh, therapies uh, believe in them. Um, even though they haven't had the kinds of trials that I'm saying are necessary. It's important to appreciate that these kinds of observations aren't necessarily wrong. Uh, uh, Much of medicine starts with a careful, uncontrolled observation, an anecdote, if you like. It's that they don't constitute credible evidence. Um, They might be right, they might be wrong, but you can't tell. That view is unrealistically rigid in the minds of health care providers who practice herbal medicine. They believe if millions of people say botanical treatment works for them, that experience has some validity. Physician Andrew Weil. I have gotten many people off of pharmaceutical antihistamines and onto stinging nettles with very good results. This is a plant that has no toxicity, no side effects, and really works. It ends symptoms like itchy eyes and sneezing and and all the kind of stuff that goes along with hay fever. Why would it be preferable for a patient accustomed, say, to antihistamine over-the-counter medications that anybody could buy in a pharmacy to turn to this plant called stinging nettle? Because antihistamines have awful side effects. Uh, They make you groggy, they interfere with mood, they interfere with sleep, they contribute to depression. But, you know, there is a very good, there's a good placebo-controlled, randomized, double-blind study demonstrating the efficacy of stinging nettles. And I find that, you know, most doctors, not only have they never heard of stinging nettles, but it's beyond their conception that there could be a, such a test that's in the literature, but there it is. Dr. Weil feels that because herbal therapy is generally not taught in medical school, it remains a foreign subject to most doctors. But there's another factor at work, according to historian and author Barbara Griggs in London. The trouble with herbal medicine has always been that it's been a very good medicine for amateurs. So what do the doctors do? I mean, doctors are not keen on people doctoring themselves. I mean, this is as true today as it was 1,000 or 10,000 years ago. So doctors throughout the ages, especially in the last 2,000 years, have always been at pains to distance themselves and to distance medicine from this simple common practice of you go out into your, into your back garden and pick a leaf of this or a bloom of that and brew it up and it'll help your cough or your hangover or your indigestion or whatever it is. Regardless of motive, today's medical establishment, including the powerful American Medical Association, or AMA, is often at odds with the huge wave of public interest in alternative health care. According to Professor Varro Tyler, former dean of the pharmacy school at Purdue University, 
doubtful doctors are simply ill-informed about herbs. There is a good deal of confusion among persons who are not specialists in the field about nomenclature, for example, in the herbal field. A plant, a common plant such as chamomile, has ten different scientific names. And to uh, revert to uh, one of the uh, AMA's recent errors, apparently uh, the people involved did not know the difference between ginseng and Siberian ginseng. They're totally different. And yet uh, the AMA uh, failed uh, to recognize that these two plants were different, and the authors who were physicians of the paper that was published didn't recognize that they were different. And so you have a a rather serious error in accusing ginseng that might have been due to something uh, from Siberian ginseng. And that's the kind of thing where uh, more knowledge is required than those people possess, unfortunately. Against this confusing backdrop, it's perhaps not surprising that herbal medicine in the United States finds itself in the awkward position of what's been called a regulatory twilight zone. Current federal law guarantees public access to certain non-prescription health products, including vitamins and herbs. Although herbs obviously are consumed as medicine, technically they're not classified as drugs under the law. Thus, producers of these products are prohibited from making any health claims on the packaging to indicate, for example, that echinacea is used for cold symptoms. Professor Tyler. If you look at the legislation uh, from 1906, from 1938, from 1962, the intent of Congress was to grandfather all of these herbal remedies to permit them to be sold as drugs Uh, even without the modern proof of efficacy that came in after 1962. However, the Food and Drug Administration, by a very clever application of administrative regulation, said, yes, these can be sold, but if you make any claim for them on the label, if you say they're good for anything or good to treat anything, then we will consider them as an unapproved drug and we will confiscate them. To be federally approved as a drug, each herb would have to undergo the testing process that typically costs hundreds of millions of dollars. As a practical matter, this is simply prohibitive for botanical suppliers. Thus, the marketplace now is filled with products whose labeling reveals little and is almost certain to leave most consumers baffled. Well, I hope we will continue to require proper studies before we grant claims. FDA physician Robert Temple. I would say that we now have complete availability, at least, of nutritional supplements, which includes all herbals, um, so long as they don't make claims, so that to the extent people in the community think they know what they're doing and think they know what they want, they have near complete access to them. And I, I like the idea that it's quite clear that if you want to make claims, you have some work to do, which I believe you should. Let's take an example, uh, an ancient uh, sleep aid and minor tranquilizer, valerian. Professor Tyler. It's a mild tranquilizer and has less side effects than some of our synthetic drugs. Is it addictive? No, it's not addictive. And it's been used for this very purpose for at least a thousand years. So you might say that valerian had been adequately tested (laughs) by people just because of the millions and millions of doses that had been taken without any reporting of of adverse side effects. Now, I I want to emphasize immediately that our Food and Drug Administration will not accept that. They say that history doesn't count. The dilemma of how to regulate herbs is faced by other nations as well. One possible model for resolving the dispute is found in Germany. Commission E, a panel of the German Federal Health Agency, has been evaluating plant medicine since 1978. Physicians, pharmacists, pharmacologists, and other commission members have methodically reviewed over 300 botanical remedies. Broad scientific studies, a pattern of historical use, and even individual cases reported by doctors are deemed relevant. To date, about 200 of these herbal remedies have been approved. Physician Andrew Weil. 
I would love to see more research on some of these products, but the German Commission E has done an enormous amount of work to sort out those herbs that are likely to be uh, useless and possibly dangerous from those that are likely to be safe and effective. Uh, and it's amassed a great deal of data uh, on them and has also clearly indicated the need for future research. It's an open question whether the United States will ever adopt a system along the lines of the German Commission E to determine which plants are effective remedies. But experts in botanical medicine insist that a great deal of scientific literature already exists on the healing properties of herbs. A computer database compiled in Chicago at the University of Illinois College of Pharmacy has amassed summaries of some 130,000 scientific articles on plants and their potential use as medicine. The information is collected with funding from the UN's World Health Organization. The project director, Professor Norman Farnsworth, believes that for some herbs, solid evidence does exist. Those few plants uh, saw palmetto, which is used for benign prosthetic uh, hyperplasia. Um, it's enlarged prostate. Right. There is uh, nettle root. I won't bother you with scientific names. And you, you'll notice when I go through the list, all of these grow in the United States. There is feverfew, which uh, uh, if, if you take a fresh leaf even of feverfew and chew it up, if you have migraine, the migraine attack goes away or is greatly reduced in pain. Then you have garlic, which obviously uh, is, is used for cardiovascular problems at lowest cholesterol, about 17%. Not dramatic, but uh, it, it does it. It also inhibits platelet aggregation, which could prevent stroke. Uh, ginkgo biloba, the oldest fossil tree on the planet. Uh, this is grown in South Carolina. There is a plantation with 10 million ginkgo trees probably the largest stand of any plant ever in the history of the world. And they don't come out and say this is used for Alzheimer's disease, but what they're saying is it improves retention, loss of memory. So those are about the ones where we, we know from clinical studies and animal studies and in vitro studies, we know the mechanism of action, we know the chemical constituents, and we know uh, whenever there are side effects, it's usually of an allergenic nature. And if you stop taking it, the allergy goes away. Dr. Farnsworth adds that there are many other herbs which may have genuine medicinal effects, but which have not yet been subjected to the same degree of scientific testing. In this category, he places ginseng, the small perennial plant widely taken in Chinese medicine for its purported revitalizing qualities and host of other uses. Chinese medicine is the oldest known system of botanical healing. Today, the official roster of Chinese remedies, known as the pharmacopoeia, lists some 700 plants, each identified with its specific curative properties. The use of Chinese medicinal herbs made the difference between illness and health for Andrew Geddert in Oakland, California. I had uh, Crohn's disease, which is a gastrointestinal disorder, and that was untreated by Western medicine. I'd also tried various other nutritional methods, and nothing had helped me. So I sought the help of Chinese herbs, and um, gradually I felt my um, digestion began to improve, improve. I was having significantly less pain. I was um, no, no longer had to be hospitalized, and so I became a, a real true believer. Geddert embarked on a serious study of Chinese herbal healing and now conducts a clinic in Oakland, California, in association with Dr. Feng Feng, a formerly trained physician and author who was born in China. According to Dr. Feng, disease results from an imbalance of yin and yang, the two basic life energies said to be present in bodily organs. How can you determine the degree of imbalance of my yin and yang? Oh, because I check your pulse and see that from your pulse and see how your five organs work. Wh which, which organs are those? The heart, the lungs, the stomach, and the liver, 
and in in, in your kidney. Uh, kidney. These five organs must be work together peacefully, and you feel better. Depending on his diagnosis, Dr. Fung could prescribe several herbal remedies, some containing ingredients familiar to Westerners, like cinnamon or chrysanthemum, and some with descriptive names like cramp bark prescribed for menstrual pain. The herbs are usually brewed up into a tea or infusion, which the patient drinks. Physician Andrew Weil in Tucson. Chinese herbal medicine in practice differs from Western herbal medicine in that instead of prescribing single remedies, they always prescribe combinations of remedies, and usually never fewer than 12 plants in one prescription. Some of the plants are there because they're considered uh, as adjuvants of other herbs. Licorice, for example, is, is present in almost in many, many Chinese herbal formulas. For one thing, it's got a sweet taste that disguises the taste of some of the more bitter constituents. But also, licorice is con- widely considered to be something that increases the effect of other herbal medicines. Chinese herbal philosophy strongly emphasizes the concept of synergy. In other words, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Healing properties are generally attributed to the interaction of plants in a mixture and not individual herbs. In recent years, Chinese researchers have begun applying modern scientific tests to the ancient herbal formulas. And in a remarkable number of cases, there has been verification of the effects attributed to these plants in the traditional system. You know, not in all cases. I'm sure there's some plants there that are worthless or that are there just for superstitious reasons. But you know, there have been some that have been tested that really work. You know, a classic example is ephedra, which was the, is the oldest medicinal plant of which we have written records. There are records from uh, several thousand years ago documenting the use of this plant, recommending it for asthma and, and uh, chest congestion. And it's now, as I said, the source of a Western drug, ephedrine, that we use for treating asthma. So there's likely to be a lot in the Chinese herbal pharmacopoeia that will pan out by modern testing methods. This intriguing intersection of Western science and ancient Eastern knowledge is likely to produce a kind of synergy of its own. And I think that's really the great future in herbal medicine is to work hand in hand with, um, with Western medical treatment. Do you think there are certain kinds of conditions which are more effectively treated by herbal medicine? In terms of um, gynecological complaints, immune disorders and digestive disorders, Chinese medicine and herbal medicine have a great deal to offer in uh, more maintenance uh, situations. In other words, if somebody is vomiting about blood and they have tremendous abdominal cramps, they may need to go to the emergency room, but eventually um, when they are not hospitalized, the uh, herbs can have a great deal of impact so that they don't have um, to take so many Western medicines. In terms of gynecological complaints, we get very, very good results with uh, women with PMS, hot flashes during menopause, uh, menstrual cramps. We get, you know, tremendous results. In addition to drinking herbal teas for medicine, some medicinal plants are eaten as foods and spices. This practice was taught to Martin Yan, who grew up in Guangzhou, China. He's now an internationally acclaimed chef based in San Francisco and host of the PBS television series Yan Can Cook. Most traditional house, Chinese household, they practice herbal medicine as a religion. My mother always cooked something with herbs. And the Chinese believe in preventive holistic healings. They believe in preventive medicines. Yan continues to use herbs in his own renowned cuisine, not just for flavor, but for medicine. When I make soups, and we do a lot of ginger. Ginger is a very healthy food itself, help digestion, help a lot of things. And I use tangerine peels, and I use um, occasionally use ginseng. Gin- ginseng? Ginseng. And I also use a lot of type of Chinese herbs to uh, help digestions, so... In my pantry, I actually have a variety of herbs. That some herbs lead a double life, both as culinary flavorings and as useful medicines, is nowhere more delectably evident than in the cuisine of India and its island neighbor Sri Lanka. 
Most of the spices blended into a dish of curry promote smooth digestion of the foods they season. The garlic can help ward off a cold, and hot peppers, either in mild or incendiary doses, can promote good circulation and ease conditions of the lungs and sinus. In fact, a well-spiced meal can be powerful preventive medicine. To learn about the art of healthy Eastern eating, I spent time in the kitchen with Dr. K. Ganeshan, a gifted chef who happens to be a medical doctor from Sri Lanka, educated at England's Royal College of Surgeons, and now living in the United States. Yeah. We're chopping up some cabbage. Chopping it rather fine. Fine, ca- fine chopping quickens the cooking process. And so we're going to have sort of a curry tonight of cabbage and carrots with onions and chilies and other spices. Yes. Yeah. Cabbage by itself. Sometimes cabbage can be t- uh, cooked with just salt and a little turmeric, and it's very tasty. Turmeric is that bright yellow spice. Turmeric is a bright yellow spice. It's a, it's a, one of the best antiseptics for the intestinal system. In fact, turmeric is used on the outside for as a poultice for for uh, starting abscesses. At the stove, Dr. Ganeshan began by sautéing these onions, along with mild chili peppers and the flavorful seed spices fenugreek, cumin, and black mustard. As a sumptuous aroma rose up from the pan, he added the thinly chopped cabbage along with carrots. Cabbage has its own water, so to start with, it it can cook by itself. Uh, then we keep checking to make sure it's not sticking at the bottom. And if it begins to do that, then we add a little extra water. Yeah. Good. Once the cabbage starts, begins to cook, then it's time to add the powdered spices. Hardest part of the job is opening the bottle of the powdered spices. And for this curry, we're going to add powdered cayenne, which is the red one, the hot one. Don't want to add too much of that cayenne because it's pretty powerful stuff. It is. Uh, Cumin powder. Ground cumin powder. Ground cumin, about half a teaspoon, and uh, coriander. Coriander is, we can add more of coriander. That's sort of a heaping teaspoon. Teaspoon. Coriander very soft in the stomach, so um, it aids the digestion. Now we're adding turmeric, which is a bright yellow powder, but t- too much of it can be bitter. So the usual proportion is, uh, if we add one teaspoon of cayenne, you would add half to one of cumin, a uh, little more than one of coriander, and only about a quarter of turmeric. A little bit of ginger powder is good, it aids the digestion and uh, garlic. Of course, garlic could be minced whole or it's available in a powdered form. That's right. Now, garlic, when it's minced whole, it's, it's best added along with the onions uh, and fried within the oil. That, that works well and it's, 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 a, it's a great flavor when it's fried. When you're first preparing the base for the vegetables that are later added. That's correct, yeah. It's going to take a little oil to cook. The sizzling now is, is when the when the cabbage is losing its water.
What a grand design that nature should serve up valuable medicines in the foods and spices we so enjoy. And what a wondrous mystery that cures for human diseases lie undiscovered in the vast natural forest we call the Medicine Garden. I'm David Freudberg. You've been listening to The Medicine Garden, written, produced, and narrated by David Freudberg. If you'd like to order a cassette tape of The Medicine Garden to review the information about herbal remedies, please call us at 1-800-5-LISTEN. We'll repeat that number in a moment. Associate producer for this program, Lisa Mullins. Mixing engineer, Steve Colby. Consultant, Mark Blumenthal. Music written and performed by Jim Richards, based on a theme by Antonin Dvorak. Special thanks to Tony Buck, Trina Tsuderos, Groton Baldwin, Catherine Karapetian, Jim Duke, Bob Carty, and to Harnett's Homeopathy and Body Care. This program is presented by Far Reaching Communications. Again, to order a cassette copy, call 1 800 5 LISTEN. That's 1 800 5 L I S T E N. Thank you for listening. Funds for this public radio international program were made possible by the Herb Research Foundation, General Nutrition Centers, Nature's Way, and the Public Radio International Program Fund. PRI Public Radio International.